Hello my friends, John LaRuffy here with another Straight Up Solo. And in this episode, we're going to take a look at Excavation Earth. I've had this game for quite some time, but it kind of slipped through the cracks in regards to my solo reviews. So, without any further delay, let's go ahead and take a look at what this game plays like when you play solo. And I'll also speak a little bit about the modified solo rules. Because at this point, I have a couple of expansions for the game, and I've incorporated those modifications into the rules for the solo. So, let's go take a look. Okay, and as usual, please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. And if you have, I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. So, a couple things. First of all, the money that I'm using here, the wooden money, is from a different game. So, just uh, ignore that. I'm not using the credits they have. Um... Second of all, I'm not playing with any of the expansion components except for the rules of the uh, the solo that comes in the second edition. The, it, it's the one that's the, it belongs in a museum. It's not a second edition, but that's the second expansion. So I will speak a little bit at the end about what I think about, but I haven't used the second edition in full, or the, I'm sorry, <laughs> the second expansion in full. I have used the first expansion in full. So I'll give you some commentary on that too uh, when, when we're finished with this as far as the review and stuff is concerned. But let me explain to you what we're doing in this game. This game is a sort of like a set collection market manipulation game. I mean, that's what it says in the rule book and I would agree with it. What you're trying to do in this game is you're trying to collect specific artifacts that are on this board that are available or buy them from the black market. And when you collect them, you can take samples of them by putting a cube in these little spots right here. And that will, at the end of the game, earn you money for how many cubes you fill in this way and how many you do in this case, going up and down like that. And if you happen to complete one of these rows, then you will immediately at that point get yourself a bonus card, like so, from the top of the deck. And that will increase the amount of things you can do, effectively the amount of turns you have, in this game because every turn requires you to play a card. Uh, so, so the board itself is like an old defunct earth, I guess, where everybody's left and it's all unha uninhabited and they're digging up these, basically this junk and they're calling them artifacts, right? So you've got like this, you know, old rim of a car tire uh, or um, let's see. So this, this uh, dinosaur costume here or a uh, worn out looking soccer ball, etc. And so those are all these artifacts. And you're this alien species that comes over and they're basically, you know, you're buying these things just like any other piece of art that somebody might buy um, in an eclectic way <laughs> in different circumstances. And you have these um, explorers over here that you need to have in certain areas to do certain actions, okay? Then over here, there is this mothership, which has to do with kind of an area influence me mechanism. And the person who has the most, I'm sorry, not area influence, area majority. And the person who has the most cubes in these things will score money, which is also your point at the end of the game, um, depending if you have, you know, the most or the second most, etc. And each round, it depends on what the situation is, whether there is, uh, you know, a... Um, a payout for the first or the second place or even the third place, even though there is no third place in a solo game. The other thing you have is that you have these individual markets up here with these different color buyers and you have these cubes, which are traders. Now, in this case, the black is representing the solo player. And so I don't have any traders out here right now. I have to work to get some traders out here. And a lot of my traders are all caught up in these mechanics over here and this is envoys or as security guards and so there's definitely a tightness in this game about having the right pieces in the right place at the right time to make the big sale and that is the crux of what you're trying to do you're trying to basically set yourself up to have the right artifacts and the right combination and have a bunch of interested buyers in these markets where you also have traders and make huge trade agreement moves where you're gonna sell up to three different artifacts of the same color in three different markets with a bunch of buyers who wanna buy them, jacking up the price and helping you get the most for your money. I'm sorry, the most for the artifacts, most money for it. And at the end of the game, the most money wins. Um, 
Now, how, now what, what kind of moves can you do? So there's a bunch of actions that you can do. Uh, you could travel, and I'm going to demonstrate these all because basically I am in the third and final round of the game. There's three rounds of this game, and so I'm about to start the third. Um, I've already done the preparation for the third round. We're about to have the actions. But you can travel by spending a card and moving a certain number of fuel tanks, depending on the card, spaces, and you can break that up between all of your explorers however you want. And each of these spaces are basically like one move. And there's also spaces for the black markets here, which allow you to buy and sell into these stacks directly. And then there's spaces for the market, which all correspond to each individual market up there. You can excavate where you play a card of a specific color and you can take up to two artifacts on the board as long as you have two separate explorers in two separate areas that are next to that color. So for instance, if I was to excavate now, I could only grab one of these. However, with this player power, these guys are the excavators, so he can actually get a second artifact from an adjacent spot. But most of the time, you're trying to manipulate your travel to put your explorers in spots where when you play one excavate action, you'll get two artifacts for it. And you're trying to choose the artifacts you haven't had samples for. And there's different rarities of the different artifacts. And the more rare it is, the more money it could be worth if you sell it on the black market. However, when you sell to these markets, it's a whole different and somewhat confusing way to evaluate the sale. It takes a little bit of time. That's probably the toughest thing to kind of figure out as far as all the different things in this game. Once you do figure it out, it makes more sense. But they do write down on here kind of how it works. Uh, but it, it can definitely take some, okay, now what am I doing here? And that's probably the most complicated part. You can go to a market and you can play a card that matches the specific market icon. So for instance, if I, if I traveled up here and matched with this, then I could take actions over here, a market action. What that allows you to do is put a trader in, like one of my cubes in that, in that actual spot so that I can conduct business there, make a sale. And it also lets me put um, one wild if I want and one specific color of the card of my, or the color of my choice in this to increase the number of buyers. So that does two things. Number one, it makes the market more favorable for me to sell there. Number two, it makes the artifact specifically more popular in that color, which will enhance the value of that artifact. So that's the market. I've talked about the sell action. I'm just going to demonstrate that when I finally do it, but that's basically how you sell, you know, different artifacts here for major money in the game. You can play a command action where you spend a card of any color that matches one of these markets, and then you're allowed to put one of your traders in that market and also put one of your traders on the mothership or remove a trader from the mothership, which will then allow you to activate one of those specific special rule cards that are up here that give you something. They're like action cards that do something for you. And they do all sorts of things. You can smuggle where if you are in a black market, you pay a card that has that icon on it, and it allows you to either buy up to two markets or buy up to two artifacts from the black market for their value plus one or sell up to two from your storage hold, your cargo hold. And you could sell any color you want. You could buy any color you want. They don't have to match the card or anything like that. And then there's also some special rules if you're playing with some of the expansions. And there are other special rules if you're playing with a different expansion for the command as well. So there's other kinds of cards that are outside the scope of this video because I'm not going to talk about them um, because I really haven't explored them enough yet to talk about them. The survey action, which you don't see over here, is a couple of cards dealt out. In the, um, in the first round and the second round, you'll actually have cards out here that are dealt, and these will give you uh, an understanding of where new artifacts are going to come up. And the survey action allows you to swap one of those cards with one from your hand, giving you a card of a different color and a different uh, icon potentially, but also letting you do, um, letting you take some I, uh, additional artifacts out of here. And you can, you place one on the board and you can also purchase one, but you have to purchase it for double the cost. So it's kind of an expensive way to, to do that. Also, it lets you do the, the, um, the turn order and it would let you put um, a specific colored one of these uh, buyers on the observation barge if you were playing with one of those one of the expansions that does that there is an exhibit action which i have not explored yet which has to do with it belongs to the museum 
where basically you are playing a card and putting a specific art, uh, artifact that you have um, on exhibition. And I'm, again, I'm not going to go into that, um, but there, that is something you could do if you have that expansion. And then finally, you could pass. So that's all the different things you can do in this game. And they are all interrelated and all luckily somewhat described on this player aid right here. And for the most part, this is helpful to help you know the majority of what you're doing. Although I still find that I have to refer to the rule book from time to time to get some of the nuances because it's not completely there. But they did do a good job in the rule book of making sure that at least you had this, okay, which is, which is really important. I've played games before where they just have no player icon. You got to remember all the steps to do that. And it's in, you end up having to have a player aid or something made or you download something because it's just miserable to try to remember what your options are. So this game has that. Now, in the expansion, they did a great job including these two cards. I should say the second expansion. The second expansion includes two cards that show the intricacies and the steps of the solo. And they are good enough to pretty much get you what you need um, for the most part. Because what this game has is it's a lot of priorities and a lot of if this, then this. If that, then that. If that, then that. It's a very simple uh, to execute solo um, situation based on these cards. These cards are what will drive the actions. But how those actions get executed as far as priorities is pretty complicated. Now what I will say is this. If you get good at this game, you basically can um, assume that the AI, Zoo in this case, will do the most advantageous thing for him every time and do the thing that hurts you the most every time. So it does make sense, the priorities, once you go, and you don't have to memorize them and refer to them after, even after half a game, you kind of realize, okay, he's obviously going to do this because this makes the most sense. It hurts me and it helps him the best. But they're all written here to help you figure that out should you need information. Okay, so enough of that. The way the game is played is you play two actions, then the opponent plays two actions. In this case, I have the first um, player marker because I went, I did the first, um, the first survey last turn. So what am I going to do? Well, I have this whole hand of cards over here that is off camera. And this is what I'm working with. I'm not going to have those out on camera. Just the game is just too wide. And so there's a, a variety of different um, travel cards I can use that just let me travel. But then there's also color cards with market combinations that can allow me to do other actions as well. So I, in my hold, have a bunch of stuff that could help me sell um, these yellow artifacts for a decent price. The issue is, is that yellow is the least popular, tied for the least popular, artifact to sell right now and I don't have any traders at all on the board much less any in the yellow spot so what should I do well I got to fix that so the first thing I'm going to do is try to fix that by by stoking the markets um, that will help me and this one is particularly good because as I load up the markets I'm going to end up pushing these off which I don't want to do and that's not going to help so I'm going to begin by playing this card right here this is going to be an orange um, actually no the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to play uh, this card right here, which allows me to travel twice, okay? So I'm gonna go one, two, so now I have a person in that spot. Now I can play, let's see, let's play this orange market card. It doesn't matter the color, but I need this icon right here. All right, and this icon matches that market, and that will let me do a market action. And so what that simply lets me do is it allows me to place one trader in that market, my last trader as a matter of fact, and then I can play one wild and one of any color that matches, or, sorry, any color I want, doesn't even have to match this. So even though this is orange, I can play a yellow here. When I do that, it forces this out because you can only have four guys in the market, and now this becomes a more lucrative, at least it's tied for second place, meaning that the icons I would sell, or the artifacts would at least be five bucks um, per artifact instead of uh, zero, which is where it was in the first place because it was tied for last. Okay, so I've done that. Those are my two actions. Let's see what he's going to do. First thing he's going to do is sell. So he's going to sell one to three artifacts in the most lucrative markets. He has all sorts of options here. He's completely full. 
So he's going to sell three artifacts, and his three are these orange right here at the most lucrative markets. Um, now, in this case, the, the red is actually more um, lucrative in that regard, and he has more people in the red spot because he only has one guy, and then he could do a wild. So he could sell up to two of the orange, but it's not as lucrative as the red. So again, I could go through and see the sell priorities and, and figure that out. I could say the color he can sell the most of, and which in this case um, defaults to the red because it's he could sell two orange or two um, or two red at this point. But then it's the most popular color, which is definitely the red. Hence, what I'm saying is it makes sense. So he's going to sell both of these, okay? And these are going to go out of the game. I'm just going to put them there for a moment. And when he sells, he is going to sell to to places he has traders. The way that the sale works is you look and see which is the most popular or wh where does the color rank. In this case, it's a seven. So that is the most popular, meaning that each of these artifacts is going to be worth nine a piece. Okay. So we have nine, 18, and then each of the buyers in those regions are going to be worth two more. So that'd be nine, 18. Um, actually, no. So it's not nine, 18. See, I always goof this up. It's nine total. It doesn't matter how many you sell here. So it is nine total. Then, because, and, and I'll just show you what, it's. this is why it's just a little bit confusing with the sell action, because it's not about each of them. You, when you sell them, um, you earn credits not for the sale, not for each um, artifact. You earn it for the total sale period. So if I sold one of these, it would have been nine. If I sold three of them, it's nine. But the fact that you sell more of them gives you other other bonuses. So I sell these, it's nine. Plus, because I'm selling to two different markets, you get a plus three on those. So that means 12. And then each of the, uh, the guys in the market, the buyers, is two more. So 12, 14, 16, 18. Okay? Now, if that's confusing, it's because it is kind of confusing. And it's just the toughest part of the game to figure out. But you just have to kind of work through it until it makes sense. So he gets $18, so that's going to be 18 points for him, rough. Basically, that's how it works in this game. Money is your points. Now, he doesn't get a bonus card like usually you would. These go out of the game, and then what happens is all of these guys who are in the queue are going to come back in here, and the people that made the sale are going to go into this holding spot so they don't flood right back in. And then each of these places that sold, his trader is going to come up here and become an envoy in that icon. So again, helping his area majority spots over there. Now, the other thing that did was it unfortunately robbed me of that one a wild merchant or wild buyer. So that hurt me in that case. But that's the way it goes. So that was his first turn. His second turn is going to be to command. So he's going to assign one trader to this market if, it's, if um, it doesn't have any in there already. Well, he just used his guy, so there it goes. And then he assigns one envoy to that spot as well. If, and here's the one major change about the solo rules in the second edition, which really works well. If he already had a majority, he would not assign, he would pull it off, he would get $5. And that is very important and a very big upgrade because what I found when I played without those secondary rules from the second expansion, and they're now put out there, you can use them whenever, is that he would just continue to feed this market and he had no limit on the number of cubes he would have. In this case, he does have a limit. He can only have as many cubes as are in one, um, the, the total number you have 22 plus two more, so 24 cubes. That's all he gets. It makes it much more fair because what I found playing it was he would just dump into these things and just completely crush me on the majority. And I'd never have a chance to score any of those because he kept adding and adding and adding. At least here he's pulling away and that's giving him some five, five bucks in compensation. So it helps me jockey for the position. I think that's a fantastic change and one that I would do. Even if I didn't own the second um, expansion, it's one you want to play with no matter what. So anyway, we just did this. That's his second turn, okay? So going back to me now, um, I have sort of set myself up, but I'm still a little weak in traders. The problem I've got is they're all tied up in here. 
or in here. So in order for me to make the big bucks, I'm gonna need to do a command action and bring some of them home, okay? Now, luckily, I believe the command action can be done in either order, it's not in one or the other. So I should be able to bring them both. Uh, yeah, I can do this. I can do this um, in the order I need to. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play, I, I wanna have a market guy here. I wanna put a guy there in that market. So what I'll do is I'll play this command action right here, okay? And I will remove one of these guys, sacrificing my majority for now, and put it back into my supply. And then it says earn three credits, then offload or acquire up to three artifacts at the black market at their listed values. These artifacts can be the same or different colors. So the good news is, is this is gonna help me offload some of these artifacts, which I'm not gonna have time most likely to pull off a big move. So in doing what they just said there, um, I'm going to earn three credits and then I'm gonna offload for the price. And given the situation that I'm in, I'm going to attempt to, I'm gonna sell these two I'm not gonna sell three because I wanna sell all three of these yellow at once. So this is just gonna give me $8. And so I'm gonna take two fives here, toss in the two. And then these go to the bottom of the black market stack over here. So that was turn number one. Oh, and then I'm of course going to assign this guy to that market, so we're good. And then turn number two, I'm still a little shy on options for that. So I think I'm going to do another one of these actions here where it's going to be a command action. And in this case, um, oh, so that the only good news about this is it gives, allows me to take an extra turn right away because I don't have a lot of fuel cards used. So I still want to do it because I'm setting this thing up and I really don't want to jeopardize any time that I could have. So yes, I could spend more of my fuel, but I think it's not worth it. I think it's just worth doing this. So I'm gonna, re I'm gonna retrieve that, that gives me this back. And then it allows me to take an extra action. So I still have two actions, or I still have one more action after this. So I'm gonna take this cube now, I'm gonna place it over here. So now I have traders at the three markets that have the yellow, which is good. Okay, now normally I would be done, but because of my extra action by removing that, I have one more thing I can do. And that one more thing is going to be the sell action. So it's gonna be the big deal. Now what's great is, and I didn't plan this this way, but it happened this way because of some of that movement. My yellow is now tied for the first, which means it pays out in full the nine to sell these three. So I can discard any card I want to do the sell. It does not have to match the color. It doesn't matter at all. I just discard it, all right? And in this case, now, I'm going to sell all three of these. So these are going to be worth nine in total for me selling them. Plus two, so that's 11, 13, 15, um, 17. And because I sold in three spots, I get plus eight. So that's going to be 25. So that's huge. That's a really big, lucky turn right there. So that's 25 plus... I get to draw two cards and choose one. And in this case, given what I've got here, I guess I'll hold on to this red one. I don't know if that's going to be helpful or not. But all of these guys go to their appropriate spots. So now I'm back in the lead on some of these things, at least competitive. And all of these guys will hit the bricks and go to this command area, pushing red down even more and sitting there. So you get the feel for what's going on. I'm not gonna continue to play because this has already gone pretty long, but you get the feel. You're trying to get artifacts, acquire them, and sell them in the best way possible. And that can be kind of complicated how you do it. But you basically can do that kind of action or you can sell to the black market like I, I didn't really demonstrate, but I talked about. Okay, so let me go ahead and tell you what I think about it. All right, so that was a good representation, I think, of the main 
kind of feel and play of Excavation Earth. I know you only saw a couple of turns from the solo, but you saw me take some turns and I just wanted to demonstrate that. I didn't want to go too long in the, the whole thing. This is a great game, I think. If you like market manipulation and you like some set, it's, it's set collection because you are trying to get different things before you sell them off. But that's, I'd say, I don't know, the market manipulation part feels like it's way more of the crux because the set collection is nice and it's, you have to do that right to get a lot of the points. But I don't, not a lot of times I think set collection games seem to be a little bit more on the easy side. This is not an easy game. It's not an impossible game, but it feels heavy. And it feels heavy because you have to work hard to set, your up, set yourself up for the kind of turns that you need to pay those huge sales. Like that sale I did right there, that's about as good as it can get. Um, and usually it doesn't go so easily. But I just happen to have the right thing at the right time with the right goods. And so you're going to get some of that because the market is manipulated in so many different ways. It just so happened that it really helped me that he sold his red first. And it kind of crashed the red market enough so that it made the yellow market equally the best with orange, which is enough to pay out in full. And so that was huge because I went from having nothing to a bunch. And I just happened to have a bunch of yellow. So you do have to force some of that based on your play. If it's not working out for you, you have to take market action so you can push those yellows out and the wilds and, and you know beef that up before you make your, your big sale. If somebody else makes a sale like the, you know, the solo, that can help because all of a sudden things might change. So you will be able to see, you do have a good idea. His deck is strategically built in a special way for the round one, round two, and round three. Round one, you know exactly what's in there, but you don't know the order. Round two, you have a good idea, but you'd still have three cards that are left over from the previous round that are mixed in. And then round three, it's the same thing. You have a good idea, but you have cards mixed in from the previous one as well. So it, it makes the solo mode very um, strategic in how it works, and it makes it take turns that are very, very strong and not just very random. And it also allows for an arc, which I think is really good about this game. A lot of times you have, um, in games like this, in, in market manipulation games, they don't, sometimes they don't seem like they have an arc. It's just like, I just keep doing this until the game is over. I buy, I try to buy low, sell high, or whatever it ends up being. In this one, because you are setting yourself up for these big pushes, and because there is the set collection, there is an arc where you are filling in things and adding to your sets and trying to make these huge plays and then trying to set yourself up for another strategic play as the market swings in one way or another. And I think that's fantastic. This is a great game for people who like that mechanism. If you don't like that mechanism, there's nothing else here for you, right? Because that's what this whole game is about. It's all setting itself up for that type of thing. But I would say that it's the funny thing about this game is that I passed on it for months when I first saw it. It just didn't look intriguing. And I think it's because I thought the board looked a little sparse. I know that sounds silly, but everything is so spread out. I think that if the game had had a more compact board with stuff a little bit more close it may have looked like there was more going on, but it actually looked like it was really light because I looked at it and it was like, oh, these are the spaces. It, it didn't have the curb appeal that I would expect. And I was completely wrong, completely wrong. Somebody pushed it as a, as a recommendation on my YouTube channel. I saw some good feedback on it. And then I'm like, all right, let's give it a try. And I really liked it. Now it slipped through the cracks years ago when I bought it first, but now since I've gotten the, um, the It Belongs in the Museum and the new solo rules, uh, that that brought it back out, and and that's really a lot better. Now it's a lot better because those solo rules I said help make that mechanic of the mothership a lot better. When you have an infinite supply in the base game of the solo cubes, and they will put in a ton throughout the game, and and it's pretty much guaranteed they're going to load it up and never take them out. That wasn't very good, and it, it really kind of it it definitely depleted the enjoyment for me on that because there's so many points to be had. In that mechanism now that they can remove it that you can game that a little better you can be just under it so you hope they remove and then you can try to make a big move and it, take a push just like you would in a, in a real game and i like what they did there they also cleaned up and tightened up a couple other things so they wouldn't make some um choices that didn't make a whole lot of sense in the end and there, those are smaller nuances but i think that was big the other thing that was really big is they limited them to 24 of those cubes 
So they, so they couldn't just do everything. And that was even more a problem in the, when I played with the, um, it's called Second Wave, but it's the first expansion. When you play with the Observation deck, I seemed like I was getting slaughtered there and over here. It just seemed like I was, I was getting just whooped up on by the AI and it was clobbering me because of that. It's Now it seems a little bit more, um, it's a little more, more fair, a little more competitive. Now, I haven't played with any of the big modules yet from the second uh, expansion itself. It belongs in a museum, but they look pretty interesting. The one that looks the most interesting is the museum mechanic, of course. Um, and so that looks cool. It's a whole other thing you can do to put your stuff on display and score points and get extra actions, etc. And it kind of adds to this game. So it's not just completely a market manipulation. There's, there's a little bit more there, which again, we'll add a little bit of choices. And I can see that. So I would say that if you were interested in this game and you like the base game, I would get the second expansion first, even though I haven't played it, because I will say that the first expansion, besides getting the extra race, was a little bit weak. The observation barge was sort of more of the same, I felt. It was some, it was it still felt like a little bit more of another kind of mothership like aspect. You already kind of had that in there. Um, and I just didn't think that was great. The ra the wild cards were okay. The races were good, which is the primary reason I bought is to get two extra races because each race you play with has a specific special ability, which makes it asymmetric, which is fun. But the the fact that the next expansion, the second one, it belongs in your museum, adds something that's different, wholly different, I think, from the the base and a couple of other things. Um, I, I, I'm going to leave, even though I haven't played it, I'm going to imply that I think it's better just because I have played the first and it was a little bit underwhelming. But this game itself is great. I think it's a fantastic game for you looking for a solo market manipulation game. It does it so well. And it's such a tough mechanic to hit when you're playing a solo game because the market, to make something fluid and not just random roll of the dice, um, is a challenge without having multiple people. So this game does it in spades, and I really appreciate it. So I give this a definitely a glowing review. I think it's a lot of fun. It's, it scratches a really, really good itch that I have in my collection for loving these types of games. And hopefully this video helped you see if this is something that you want to do or something you want to avoid. So thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Whatever you decide to play in the future, I hope you have a fantastic time doing it. Take it easy, everybody.